Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's episode, Anthony Power and I are going to be providing a background of how we got involved in the Bitcoin space, our orange pill moment, so to speak, our qualifications, our background that led us up until this point, what it's like to work in the Bitcoin industry, and our future outlook for this sector and a lot of these miners' business model. There's a lot to go through in today's video. This is one we've been asked about a lot in the comments section, so super excited to go through it. Before we do though, please take a second, hit the like button, you guys. It's 100% free to do. It's a big help to myself and the channel. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join. And let us know in the comments section below how you got involved with Bitcoin, what you think of this sector long term, and your outlook on the miners for the remainder of 2024. Now with that being said, let's get into today's video. Okay guys, so that's right. Today's video, a little bit of a shake up for you. We've been getting a lot of questions in the comment section over the last few months in terms of our background, how we got involved in the Bitcoin space and where we see power mining analysis ultimately going in the future. So we decided to take a break from the analytics today. It's another red day for Bitcoin. The miners seem to be holding up okay. So hopefully we're finding bottom here, but we thought we'd give everyone a welcome break and uh, have an episode here talking about how we got involved in the space, our orange pill moment, so to speak, and our future outlook for ourselves, the channel, and these Bitcoin mining companies as they continue to evolve through this space. So Anthony, thanks so much for being here today, and uh, good morning. Great to be here, good morning. Yeah, we're coming off the backs of a big successful video last night. We got a lot of comments, Anthony, about your new open mouth look, the YouTube uh, <laughs> sensation look, so obviously it worked. But I'm curious, Anthony, to know, I know you started your journey in the, in the British military. So how did you ultimately become an accountant and what led you to uh, the Bitcoin mining sector? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I joined the military at 17 years old. And, and, and to be honest, the reason I joined the military was there wasn't a lot of options for me. I'd left, I'd left school at 15 with, with literally uh, no qualifications, apart from a couple of passes in uh, uh, maths, chemistry, and religious education so being a catholic i passed that subject but i was very strong at maths at school i was i always found um i had an affinity with numbers um so i went to the careers office and um they offered me some of these uh, roles um the governor brought some roles and they were really low paid like cheap labor roles and i sort of like i i, I couldn't bring myself to work for that sort of level and and two doors down from the school careers office was the army careers office and I went through the uh, I went through the entrance, and there was this big sergeant sat behind the desk. And uh, he said, "What can I do for you?" I said, "I was coming to find out how much you pay." He said, "What do you mean, how much we pay?" He said, "This this army game." I said, "What you know? What what's the wages like?" And he sort of you know got me to sit down. He asked me my age. I said I was seventeen. He said um, I was an adult soldier. I was joining now. Um, I, 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 you can join the army at sixteen and become like an apprentice. But I'd, I'd gone past that period, so I had to join as an adult soldier. And the salary was about three times more than they were offering me two doors away. And I thought, you know what? That's quite good because as well as getting a salary, you get a bed and you get three meals a day. And it's like, I've hit the jackpot here. So I joined at 17 and I joined, um, I, I sat some entrance exams. I actually did, believe me, I actually did quite well in the entrance exams. I joined uh, the Royal Signals, which is like the communications for the British Army. And so I, I, I did that for a couple of years. And then I realized, having been in the army for a few years, I looked at which of the jobs were, you know, more appealing maybe and, and had better opportunity for promotion. And the, the one trade that stood out above everything else was the guys that worked in finance. And they were getting promoted like every year. And I'm thinking, that, that's where I need to be. I need to be in that space there. So I applied and I was successful. I moved across into the finance stream within the military and promotions sort of, sort of started to happen. When I reached the rank of sergeant, I applied to go on what they call um, there's like a long accountancy course in the military. It's about four years long, and I was successful going on to that there. So I did the, the the course, and you do work at the same time for the first two years, and then the latter part of it it's full time um, in the classroom. So, you know, after that period, I came out as a qualified chartered accountant, and by this stage, I was um, probably 29 or 30 years old, and so for my last 12 years, I was then posted to. 
um, to significant accountants posts um, all over the world. And, you know, an example of, of what type of role we do is like at the time, I think we had the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts were, were taking place. And, you know, when you go out to these sort of countries and you're going to take significant resources out there in terms of manpower you've got to be able to build the bases out there so the accountants will go out in an early party you know examine what requires from a cost perspective how much things are going to cost you know with the planners and then come back with a detailed report to say you know if we're going to build a site for you know three thousand troops uh you know 200 civilians accommodation food logistics etc 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 do a full detailed report what that looks like so that's a type of some of the type of projects that some of the accountants do in the army other ones could be working um, in big uh, garrison uh, towns you know basically doing the accounts for the for the whole site there and um, so really you know some varied work a lot of project work uh, you know going to new projects things that you know everything has a value so you know they, they need accountants there to sort of calculate things to make sure that we're getting value for money, so the military. So when we spend money, we're getting value for money. The accountants do a lot of work in that side of it. So it's, it's quite interesting. I finished 25 years, and I reached the level of, um, uh, you know, the uh, as an, an, like a NATO rank of E9. So it was like the, you know, the top rank you can reach as a soldier. And so, you know, really, you know, pleased with that. And, and you know, I got out at 42, and I, I, I then sort of like, you know, looked at... Um, joining the, the you know a job outside in civilian street and i went to the national health service which is it's the fourth largest employer in the world um in terms of you know in terms of employees so you've only got the the, the three that are bigger are the uh, the chinese army the indian railway and i think amazon you know that's the three biggest employees and then we've got the national health service with over one and a half million um staff members um currently there and so I did that for a few years and then I got an opportunity to go and work in Kazakhstan in the oil industry and use my skills there to, you know, to develop that time of my career. Met my wife in Kazakhstan, who's also a chartered accountant. So got two accountants in the same house. So we, we, we shouldn't be getting our tax returns wrong at this point in time. Um, and, you know, came, came back, did a little bit more time in the NHS. When I got to 50, I, I, I retired and, um, you know, I, I I went and started going on holidays, you know, as as much as and as often as I could. I mean, we, my wife, I think we we're doing like, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten holidays a year. And then COVID occurred and COVID happened and we were all locked down for two years. And it was at that point towards the end of COVID that I, you know, um, speculatively invested in a company called Marathon Digital. And that's where it started in 2020. How, how about you, Bryce? <laughs> Yeah, really interesting. And I want to dig into that, Anthony, because it seems very uh, relevant to me. You're all over the world. You've got the geographic diversification. You're working on very abstract, um, unique, one-of-a-kind accounting jobs in the army. And it has a lot of similarities to the Bitcoin industry because these companies are so dynamic and new and changing. They're spread all over the world. So I want to dig into that. My history took a little bit more, uh, I guess, traditional route, Anthony. So I grew up in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, sim similar with you, I was really good in school, loved math and science. So I went out to the University of British Columbia, which is one province over in Kelowna, BC. I was there for four years. I took business management. I actually did an exchange program to Australia. So I lived in Melbourne. I went to the F1 race there and the cricket and the... Uh, the rugby and all that kind of stuff. So that was really cool. Came back to Kelowna, started at a restaurant, and then I got referred into a telecom company here in Canada by the name of Shaw uh, Communications, which is now Rogers. It got bought out. And I worked there for 12 years. So I actually worked my way up uh, to a director position doing the satellite TV. So uh, I was responsible for the pay, the commission structures, and then ultimately operations um, and sales marketing down the road. But then exactly like you, Anthony, COVID came, we weren't working downtown anymore. So they closed the office. I didn't have to commute anymore. I had two hours extra a day. And I've always been into investing since university. Um, my roommate actually was a big Bitcoin fan way back in the day. He had 23 Bitcoin at one point in his possession, Anthony, and he lost it all on online poker buy-ins using Bitcoin as the, uh, 
as the buy-in. So he got me involved in it. He actually transferred me a little bit of Bitcoin way back in the day. Uh, so I've always been uh, a known uh, associate of Bitcoin, I guess. But then when I had that extra time, I decided, hey, I'm going to launch the channel. I started in the cannabis space. Then I got into some alternative energy, EV, and then ultimately got into the Bitcoin mining sector. And that's really where I've where I've kind of found my place now, obviously, with you and, and power mining analysis. So a little bit different background, but uh, ultimately led us to the same place. So now you, you've got your education, you're a chartered accountant, you've got some extra time on your hands, you're interested in Bitcoin, you probably did pretty good on those marathon shares, I'm sure. Um, then what happened, Anthony? What have you been doing now in, the, in Bitcoin prior to power mining analysis? So, yeah, so, you know, after buying the, the, the marathon shares and they really rose in value very, very quickly, I, I, the timing was just was perfect. And I really didn't know what I was buying into. I didn't, I knew about Bitcoin, but not, not in any, I wasn't really interested in Bitcoin. Um, I just, I picked up the fact that people were looking at this company called Marathon. I'd been buying banking stocks. I was trying to play it safe, you know, five or 10%, maybe a year in terms of share price growth. But this Marathon stock went up something like seven or eight fold in literally a space of about five weeks. And so it got me thinking what I'd invested in. I didn't invest a lot in, it wasn't a great amount of money, but it, you know, it had, the profits had risen drastically, you know, drastically in a short space of time. So I wanted to know a little bit more about the company. And I realized there was another company in the UK called Argo Blockchain. That was in the same space. So I bought a little bit of Argo Blockchain as well. And then um, I, I realized there was, there, was a, there was like a sort of like a, a growing um, number of people uh, looking at mining stocks. Um, and going back to that sort of like uh, late 2020, early 2021, I can remember uh, watching CNBC um, in, the, uh, in the mornings in UK time and the tickers going across the bottom and Argo would appear regularly as, as like, a, you know, a stock that was being, you know, purchased or sold. And, you know, the share price went from, you know, in December, it was a 30 million pound company. And in February, it was a 1 billion pound company. So, you know, it went up 30x in the space of eight weeks. And um, that got everyone's attention. Um, fortunately, I did sell some of those, you know, quite a few of those shares at the, at the close to the highs when it got close to like three pound a share. And, um, but I, I, you know, like a lot of people, when the share price came down, you, you think it's temporary this and you buy, buy a few more back or a few more shares out of the profits and the share kept going down. And we, you know, we discussed on many podcasts, what's, what's happened to Argo since then. But at that same time, there was a, there was a guy on YouTube called Blonity and he was doing lots of podcasts and updates and I quite liked what he did. And I thought, you know what, I, I can do some numbers in, 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 in a way that, that can start, you know, um, doing some sort of analysis. And I, I opened a Twitter account and I started just, um, you know, tweeting from sort of like um, maybe March, April, May in 2021. Um, and just started out. I, looked at, I think it was like six miners and I started looking at my first tables and that was um, Bit Farms, that's Hot Hive, Argo, Marathon, right, platforms. And so those six were, the, were the sort of like the main miners going back to that period. And bear in mind, you know, this space in, in Bitcoin mining for, for public companies has been around about six years. You've got Hive and Hut and Bitfarms, the three oldest um, miners, um, all Canadian. Uh, they've been out there the longest. That's six years. So it's still really, it's, it's still a, an infancy in terms of, of a business. Um, and Blondity actually reached out to me. So uh, he actually liked what I was doing. He, he started using some of my tables in his, um, in his YouTubes. Uh, videos and podcasts and he reached out to me and said like you know would, um, towards the end of 2021 would I like to sort of like join him and he'd like he'd like um, pay me to do the the financial stuff and help him with the channel and as I said yes um he, he sort of vanished he, he he got away moved away from the space and this time the bitcoin price has started to, to really start to fall and then April 2022, I just kept going in the space. I mean, you know, we, you know, we watched, the, we were watching the Bitcoin price just, you know, every day it was just dropping and dropping through that, that sort of like that bear cycle. Um, Compass Mining reached out to me and asked me if I'd like to write some articles on Bitcoin mining. And I said, look, I, I'm, I'm an accountant. I don't do that. You know, I don't, I don't do um, articles. And, and they said, no, no, you, you just put your tables and put some words to it and, and, and put them in article format and we'll pay you for it. And I'm like, 
really? And so I, I said, well, I can, I'll sign up for three. Let's do three articles. That, that's not going to stretch me too much over the next few months. And I did three in the first month. In fact, I probably did about you know four or five. Um, and, yeah, quite enjoyed it. And, you know, I think uh, last night or, or this morning, my 70th article was published with Compass. And I've written some for Coindesk as well. So it's just gone on from there. I, I, I kept doing, you know, uh, three to four articles a month over the last sort of couple of years. And so, yeah, it's been, it's been good. Then then we go forward then to sort of uh, the end of 2023. And bear in mind now, we're getting to like nearly three years in the space and providing a lot of um, interest on Twitter using the analysis and, you know, the, the, the number of followers had, had grown um, to like, sort of like I think like 10,000. So there was a lot of people like, you know, interested in what I was doing. And so I know it's about time to maybe look at, you know, doing something more than what I was doing. And that was where the sort of like, um, sort of last year, towards the end of last year, the idea for power mining analysis came about. Well, and what's so interesting, Anthony, I, I started my channel on January 1st, 2021. And if you guys want a good laugh, go back and watch my first video. It is the most awkward, embarrassing, weird video ever. But I told myself, I just have to try. I have to try no matter how good or bad it is, I'm going to get one out. And it, it really has come a long way. And what's interesting, Anthony, Sue Ennis was my first interview in the Bitcoin mining space, obviously for HUD8 Mining. And that started to snowball and I started to get a lot of these CEOs on the same ones that you were covering in your analysis and articles. And interestingly enough, you guys, I invited, uh, or sorry, Anthony reached out, came on the channel. We did two initial podcasts way back last year. I was so excited. I knew Anthony was a big deal. I knew he was a good analyst and had a big following. So I said, Anthony, let's get you on weekly, buddy. Let's start doing something together. And he said, absolutely not. What's the what's the value for me? Why would I come on your channel regularly? So we did our intro. We met each other. We knew each other. And then it kind of ended. And then, yeah, right around the December of 2023, Anthony had reached out. And I'll let you tell the story of, of how the power mining came about. But he basically said, hey, I've got an idea. I think this might be a good partnership with your platform. We cover a lot of the same companies. What do you think? So that's kind of how the power mining came about. But it started off a little bit rocky there, Anthony. And I think uh, you thought I was trying to take you for a run. But I'll let you uh, fill in the gaps on the power mining. And then we can kind of talk about our future outlook. Yeah. And so, you know, when, when you're trying to do something like this and you're trying to look at you know, all the sort of parts of what we've what we've done so far, the media platform. So we, you know, as well as we're doing things on the YouTube channel, it's about also about a website. So we've got a website there that's been up and running since the end of January. So in very short space of time from, you know, actually joining together, we got a, a web designer in and gave him the scope of what we wanted, wanted it to be good, wanted it to have all the information on there, all the companies on there. And so, you know, we grew uh, you know, we, 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 we grew that website and, and launched it in, I think it was like very early, end of January or very early February. So literally only sort of two and a half months at the moment. And we're quite pleased with it. It's, you know, so much so that we've actually got another full time web designer now supporting our own web designer to take it now to another level. So, um, you know, that process is going on. We're building a second website and using the first one to make sure we've got things up to date. And then we'll, when the second website's built, we'll sort of like, you know, um, you know, parallel run and move, and move across the new website, which hopefully, you know, um, is going to be even even more sparklier and, and, and better than the one we've got at the moment. And, and I'm quite pleased. The feedback from the first one has been fantastic. Um, you know, there's, there's like 15 miners uh, details on there. I mean, there's, there's 35, 36 public miners. And, you know, if you're going to cover 35, 36 public miners, you need a whole team, you know, more than we've got at the moment. At the moment, we've got sort of six or seven people helping power mining and ice get to where it is. It's not just Bryce and, and myself. There's a whole team behind doing that. And so, you know, that takes a lot of time to do what we're doing at the moment. And I can tell you that since December, um, literally, you know, with the exception of maybe a couple of days, I'm talking like Christmas Day maybe, and, you know, another and one of the days of the holiday, it's you're at work every day. You're trying to build the brand. You're trying to make sure that you're covering as much as you can um, and you need resources to do that. You, you know, at the end of the day, you, you know, it might be for me, I haven't taken salary at the moment, but it's, it's, it's like, you know, if I can't expect everyone to do this for free, 
And so, you know, you have to pay people a salary to do it. And we've got like seven people on board here. So, you know, the challenge then is how to sort of like to do that. We've been very grateful for some of the miners to be supportive of that. And so, you know, it's great for the space. We're looking to educate people in the space. Uh, one thing we won't do is, and, and we don't do that, you'll never see any of my tweets, we don't give any sort of advice on where the Bitcoin price, you know, is going or where stock prices are going to go. Leave some other experts up to that there and then we'll judge them on their ability to forecast the future. Um, but we don't do that, but we'll, t we'll, we'll certainly do everything that's happening currently and, and, and retrospectively. So, you know, as an accountant, a lot of my analysis is going into quarterly and yearly filings and finding all the good information in those, because believe you me, their information is, is there to find, and it's all laid out there. you just got to go through sometimes 250 pages to find that one paragraph that's the meaningful paragraph. Um, so, you know, miners have to disclose information, and sometimes they'll disclose it in places that you, you, you take a, you know, a day or two to find it. But, you know, I enjoy doing that now, and because I've got more used to doing that sort of analysis, I can fly through the 10 Qs and 10 Ks for these mining companies in, 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 in quicker time and get things done. So, you know, it's, it's, it's growing that way there. Um, we're, really, we're really sort of like grateful for the support that we've received. Um, again, if you look at the, the YouTube channel, I think we've grown 7,000 followers since uh, January. And in terms of um, Twitter, my Twitter account is now getting on for 13,500 as opposed to 10,000 at the start of the year. So again, um, everything's building that way. And we're just trying to provide, you know, education out there for people so that they can make, their, you know, start their own due diligence, have something to start from and then make their own informed decisions how they want to go forward on, on, on particular mining stocks. Yeah, that's what really attracted me to this, Anthony, when you reached out is there's obviously channels like Sebastian's and Tom's. They're awesome in the YouTube space. You've got Bitcoin mining guy who's awesome in the X space. You've got uh, Patreon people. You've got people on TV. Uh, you've got the CEOs. But there's not any one centralized location. And that's really what was unique to me about the power mining analysis is it's not just one component. It's multifaceted. You've got ability to do research. You can get information. You can do video interviews. Um, we even give a platform for people to ask questions to the CEOs. So it's very multifaceted. But you're right, Anthony. We don't do break-even price targets. We don't do bullish, bearish price targets. We don't do predictions or Bitcoin forecasts. Um, ours is very much based in analysis of existing public information and education on the space. And I think that's really what kind of separates us and, and what, again, has attracted me to this sector. Now, moving forward, you talk about some of the enhancements. So we've got the new website coming. We're working on some really cool interactive geographic maps. We also want to do a lot of work on alternate revenue streams because a lot of these miners have moved out of the proprietary mining they're getting into things ranging from hardware to hosting to AI, HPC. So we want to do a better job of, of capturing that. And the nice thing I don't think a lot of people realize is you, Anthony, meet with these mining officers, the VPs, the chief mining officers, the marketing teams. So we've got the ability to help influence the metrics in this uh, in this sector and the production per one exahash that's one that you actually came up with Anthony and you've been using for years now we're working with the mining teams to try and get an all-in uh, cost per coin so it's really beneficial from that uh, lens as well that we've got access to these teams and we're able to have that two-way dialogue that ultimately becomes uh, more transparent information for the end user or, or the people watching this channel so in terms of kind of moving forward Anthony where do you see, two-part question, where do you see power mining a year or two from now? And where do you see these mining companies? Because in my mind, they're really a lot of them turning into energy infrastructure companies. And I think um, really could be opening up a big door in terms of opportunities down the road. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just, just want to touch on something you just said there before, you know, about um, if we go back and look at the first three months, I think we've had some like 15 or 16 CEOs or or senior uh, uh, executives from these companies come on the podcast and you know we we reach out on various social media to get questions in that you want to ask so these aren't always the questions that you know Bryce and myself will sit down and put together we'll reach out and get some of the questions from you guys so that we can ask the CEOs those questions and yes during the during the actual um, interviews 
I might come up with, you know, a quick additional follow on questions because sometimes they lead that way. And so it's always, you know, it's always good to have a few follow on questions and just put that, you know, a little bit of pressure on, on the CEO to, to sort of emphasize a particular area. And that was adamant in, you know, when we had Jason Les from Right Platforms. I know a lot of people sent some questions in for that there about, you know, what was going on in Rockdale uh, with regards to uh, operational hash rates. And he answered those questions, but we went down a little bit further and, and, and got him to clarify some of those points. And that, you know, so, you know, we don't want to sort of like totally softball these CEOs. Um, we want to make sure that you know they can be held to account for what they're doing, um, and that was a good and that was a good example of, of doing that. And we've got you know more interviews uh, coming up now. I'm, I'm I'm trying to think how many companies we haven't, uh, and I was thinking there's only like um, I think Mike Novogratz from Galaxy. We need um, you know uh, I think we've got Iron coming on the on the show shortly, so they'll have a, a member of their senior team coming on the on the show. Surely, but there's there's not many that we've missed out in that sort of like the the larger of the of the Bitcoin miners at the moment. So hey, Anthony, just to jump in, Iron is on Monday. You guys, it's going to be uh, the head of their AI division. So really interesting one there. If you do have questions, and the other thing I was going to say, Anthony, why I like this model so much. Great example was Bitfarms, right? When all that Paraguay concern came out, you were actually able to touch base with Ben himself. Um, before we put out a video to kind of get some firsthand information, right? Same thing with the ATM with CleanSpark, where there was all that confusion around the ATM, the insider selling. I called Matt Schultz on his cell phone to get clarification on whether it was an upsize or a net new ATM. So that's the kind of benefit of having these relationships is we don't necessarily... Um, have to have the same kind of questions and concerns. Obviously, it needs to be publicly disclosed, but we've got those means of communication to get answers and, and help you guys make in, informed decisions. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, I'm going to a conference in two weeks. I've just come back from the, from the Chico conference and you know, I was able to meet, um, you know, four mining execs at, at that conference there. So, you know, you go to these conferences where they're well represented. I think there's eight or nine being represented in, at the AIM Summit in London at the end of April. So looking forward to catching up with, with a lot of them there. And actually, the AIM Summit back in 2022 was my first was my first conference um, that I attended. And so I was a bit in awe of meeting some of these people that I'd seen them do lots of podcasts. I've been writing about them and I've been doing analysis about them. And the next minute I'm having like literally, you know, an hour's conversation with Fred Thiel um, over a coffee and um, tell me about the asset light model and the advantage of that, because I, I really couldn't work it out what they were going down that route. So I wanted to get that was one of my questions to get into him. That was two years ago. I'm looking forward to maybe catching up with him again in a couple of weeks' time to say, what changed your mind, Fred? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we've covered that in many podcasts, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's why they know why, well, why now, they changed. Well, now you're speaking at them, Anthony. You've got a, a main speaking yeah. event at Bitcoin Nashville, so both of us are going to go down there. That'll be great. It's our first time going to actually meet in person. Um, but you're on the stage there. I think Fred Teal's also talking at that one uh, alongside Michael Saylor and some big, big yeah. names in the industry, right? Hopefully I can be on the stage with Michael. Maybe we've got a you know half an hour to go over a few things. But uh, no, what they tend to do is tend to put people in the same sort of area. So it will be with miners. My first speaking uh, conference was the Amsterdam conference in October last year, and I'll tell you all a little bit of a, a story of that in there. So I'm on the stage with uh, Amanda Fabiano, who's now one of the directors of TerraWolf, um, Nazar Khan, who's the chief operating officer of TerraWolf. And uh, Aidan Killick, who's a, who's a CEO and president of High Digital, and so um, we were on the on the second day of the conference. We were on as the as the first speaking event. So bear in mind, we're in Amsterdam, one of the greatest cities in Europe, where the beer flows well in the evenings. And so I walked home with Amanda at sort of quarter to ten, just to, so we can get our mic set up. And I noticed there was three people in the audience. And I said to Amanda, I said that, you know, are they, re are they recording this? And she goes, I don't, I don't know, probably. I said, because I, I was telling my wife and my son that there'll be a lot of people watching me speak on the stage. And if I'm going to be speaking to three people, it's going to be a challenge. And she went, yeah, I was expecting more. But maybe people went out last night and they, they've not got up quick enough to come to the conference. So we went and got our mics uh, fitted up. And uh, that was in another room adjacent to where we were speaking. And then we came out 
literally with about two minutes before 10 and there was over 300 people sat down in the uh, in the audience so you know in that sort of short space of time it sort of like it then gives you a little bit of a adrenaline then because you want to make sure that you know you can put out a, a performance and it went really really well it was a good it was a good session and um, some great questions and yeah just felt felt comfortable with the with the you know these are people that are in the mind space that i look up to so believe you me you know part of me sometimes pinch myself thinking what am i doing there but i do see a lot of these mining uh, execs on a regular basis and so it's great to catch up um you know they've they've been great supporting what we're doing um you know and, and if like you say bryce if ever we've got a question we can always generally get an answer very very quickly and that one from ben we got the answer during the podcast so we reached out literally before the podcast and as we're doing the podcast his response came in and we were able to include that in the podcast as a sort of like we've got an answer for you guys on paraguay and as i say i couldn't repeat the exact response he said but in, in in certain terms it was a uh, it was all a bit of fud out of there but uh you know they've they've released something since then to show their their two main uh, directors down in paraguay um you know to show that the, the contracts of uh, all above board and and are all restored and bear in mind you know they're going to be growing you know about eight exahash in paraguay alone so they're only at seven exahash at the moment globally and they're going to have more exash than that in Paraguay by the end of the year. So, you know, that's that that needed answering, and and unfortunately, Ben came back straight away with a with a response. That's really good. Yeah, I I can't wait for Nashville. It's going to be my first conference, and you're right. It's almost a starstruck moment, Anthony. I got involved in the Bitcoin mining space um, based on stocks and finance interest. But now that I've learned about Bitcoin, I am fully down the rabbit hole. I've had the orange pill. I'm a Bitcoin maxi. And I just feel so privileged to be able every single day to wake up, get to talk to you, who's one of the best experts in the world, and talk about Bitcoin, which is something I'm so passionate about. And I remember before we started power mining, every single interview I did with, with Sue or whoever, I would say, hey, if something comes up, you guys, let me know. I want to work in the Bitcoin space. I want to work in the Bitcoin space. And then lo and behold, this kind of all came to fruition. So uh, last question for you, Anthony, where do you see the industry going over the next couple of years? For, I'll go first. For me, what I'm starting to notice is these companies are wanting diversified revenue. They don't want to be so reliant on Bitcoin because of the halving cycles and because of the, the um, I, I think just because it's so new, all the volatility in this space. So they're looking to expand their portfolios. And a lot of them have found that data centers, owning their own infrastructure, getting involved in power grids, um, working with local operators to stabilize the grid. This is really where there's a lot of opportunity. And I think it was Sam Tabar who mentioned to us, he looks at this company as, hey, we are an energy company, an infrastructure company who decides when and where to use our resources. Sometimes we feel like Bitcoin mining is a great use. Sometimes we feel like HPC is a great use. Sometimes we feel like staking Ethereum is a great use. But they have that flexibility now. And it got me thinking, energy is going to become the new gold or new Bitcoin or whatever you want to call it in the world. Everything needs energy to run. People, buildings, cars, vehicles, everything. So if you can be embedded with that system, either behind the grid or in front of the grid, involved in the transmission lines, the data centers, um, the load balancing, it really puts you in a powerful position regardless of what Bitcoin's doing. Um, obviously, I think Bitcoin's going to have a bright future, but it's really blending the worlds of the finance ecosystem, technology, utilities, and now the, the energy grid itself, which is so exciting to me because as you said, Anthony, the oldest companies in this space are like six years old. This is a brand new sector and we're getting to cover it really as these things are unfolding and coming to fruition. So for me, it's a dream come true. Every single day, I thank you for the opportunity, Anthony. And I'm just so excited to see where this whole thing goes. As you say, neither one of us knows the future, but it's sure exciting to watch it unfold. Yeah, uh, and that's a good point. I mean, you know, Sam Sam's uh, articulated the the HPC side of the business really well, where you've got the guaranteed revenues coming through because you know we can't determine what what the Bitcoin price. I mean, when it got to seventy three, and you've got these ETFs buying the Bitcoin every day, and the the inflows were, you know, were, were, it was green inflows every day, um, you know, and forcing that price up there, and then we're at sort of sixty one, sixty two thousand today. And, you know, it's still 
it's still significantly higher than it was. It's still 49% up today from year to date. Um, and then the question there you asked about where do you see in the future and that we've had so many questions. There's so much now, you know, in, 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 in the, uh, on, on X, on all the social media platforms about what the miners are going to do post the halving. And I've seen like, you know, questions like clean spark are going to buy bit farms. Let me tell you now that's not going to happen. Right. And I'll tell you why it's not going to happen. You know, if you look at the bit farms market capitalization today, and as we're speaking now, it's around about 550 million. You go and buy bit farms, you're going to pay a premium, and that premium is going to be 30, 40%. So that's going to cost you 750, 800 million, and you're going to get 7x a hash out of it. That's if the shareholders agreed to it, which they probably would, you know, that sort of price possibly would do, right? But then you start thinking, let's look at another sheet. This is the accountant me now looking at, you know, if I had the funds to build a mining company and had access to the sort of prices that some of these miners are paying. So we know that, um, that, you know, um, for every extra hash of infrastructure that CleanSpark just bought in Mississippi, it's cost about eight and eight or nine million for every extra hash. So if you do a quick calculation and say, I need seven extra hash of that sort of infrastructure there, that gets you to sort of like, you know, 60 to 70 million dollars uh, to get you to seven extra hash in infrastructure costs. And even if you turn around and say, let's call it 100, let's call it 100 million. So there's add-ons and everything like that. You've got 100 million dollars, get you to 7x. And actually, if we look at the Helios site, which was 200 megawatts that Argo blockchain built, you could argue that I think that was about 100, just over 100 million to build the facility, right? Then we look at mining machines. And to purchase these mining machines, you're going to pay um, in the region of about 15 16 million dollars per exahash because we know that they're getting these new s21s at the price of uh, 14 to 16 dollars a terahash so to get to one exahash that's a million times that so you know call it 15 16 dollars if it's 15 and you want seven exahash of machines at 15 dollars that's 105 million Right now, we said the, the infrastructure was 100 million, 105 million machines. Let's throw in another 100 million for costs that we didn't even foresee. That's 300 million for a company now starting to get to 7x ash in the current climate. Why would you spend 800 million buying bit farms? I just can't, I can't see it myself. Where are the synergies to, to do that? You know, Clean Spark have articulated as of um, Iron, as of bit farms themselves, as of Riot. As of Marathon Digital, they've all gone out there and ordered massive orders in machines to go through now for the next 18 to two years. And so, you know, the only way that these mining companies will take up any assets going through the halving will be when they are distressed, when they can pick them up for a song. And so a great example of that is like Galaxy Digital in December 2022, when Argo blockchain were about to literally file for Chapter 11, even sent the facts out with the with the paperwork on there that went live. And then they had to, to sort of like, you know, take that back. But they were ready to go in Chapter 11 and Galaxy were able to go in there and buy that site for, I think, $65 million. So something that cost literally, you know, five months before, just over $100 million, they got for six. 60 cents on the dollar. Um, so, you know, that's called, that's, that's called buying distressed assets. So that's where I see these companies looking for now. And, you know, Anthony, some of these companies... Anthony, uh, let me pause you right there, you guys. Pick up on that because that's a nice little Easter egg. Buying distressed assets is where value is created. Sounds very similar to the mining share price right now, you guys. So just wanted to throw that analogy in there. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, you, you, you know, come the halving, there might be some miners, might, might even be miners that we, we don't even cover. But, you know, there'll be miners out there that are saddled with debt, um, you know, going to go into maybe Chapter 11. And we know that some of these, some of these smaller miners, you know, got into Chapter 11 or go into Chapter 11. We have the Celsius issue there. We've had Asher on the, on the show from Hut 8. He articulated that they were able to pick up some of those Celsius assets for for for, for again you know low 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 cost on the on the dollar, and so that's the sort of areas that you know these mining companies will be looking at as as opportunities. Um, now the you know there's nothing to stop miners you know merging with each other to grow you know a, a size, and you know when we look at the the Hut Eight 
and the USBTC merger. Nobody really saw that one coming. But both had something to bring to the table. So you've got Hut 8, who had probably one of the strongest balance sheets of all the mining stocks. I mean, you know, with over 9,000 Bitcoin, um, their current their current book value is about the same as their market capitalization. So for every pound or every dollar you're investing in Hut 8 at the moment, you're getting a dollar of assets at the current market price. And so, you know, they had a strong balance sheet. What did, what did USBC bring to the table? They have facilities. They had access to cheap power. They had, you know, massive amounts of infrastructure in the US. And so they brought something totally different to the table. That was a merger of equals. And we'll see, you know, how that turns out as we start seeing, you know, Ash has said, you know, don't judge in the first six months of 2024. Judge it in that third quarter when, when they're sort of their plans start coming towards fruition. So I'd expect, you know, to see some sort of like, you know, recovery, even if it, albeit maybe slow recovery, but recovery. And we've noticed in their production updates they've started to sort of improve month by month because they really, Hot 8 really was sort of like hitting rock bottom with all the issues they had with Drumheller and in on, you know, Ontario with the, with the uh, energy provider. And they've got through that now. They relocated miners. They've got a big, you know, you know they've become a bigger company and they've got access to more, to more um, business models than just self-mining and, and the HPC centers that they have. So that's the type of thing that could happen going forward, because you've asked the question, where do we see it? We could see some of those merger and acquisitions that way. But some of these miners have got you know, facilities that can last them for the next two or three years. Look at the Childress site. Look at Corsicana. I mean, we're going to be hopefully going out to visit Corsicana this year and see what that's all about. And, you know, I'm looking forward to, to going there. That'll be my first visit to a mining company. So at least it will give me some perspective when I talk about mining companies in the future. I've actually been to a site. Well, and I was going to add in about HUD-8. You talk about the cost to build HUD-8. They just broke ground, I think, three months ago on their new site, and they're now already starting to energize it. So I definitely it's think... 73 days. Yeah, yeah it's Excellent. incredible, right? And the, and the cost they were able to build that for. So I definitely agree with you. I don't think we're going to see full-fledged M&A takeouts in the public market. I do think there may be some distressed private miners don't have access to the capital to upgrade the fleets. And therefore, they're in trouble and they need to do something, right? So very interesting stuff, Anthony. Uh, I know you guys, this is a little bit different episode, but a great way to kind of paint the full picture of how this all came about, why we're so interested in the space and, and kind of where we see our future. So Anthony, I'll kick it back to you for any closing thoughts, but thanks for sharing the story and really insightful as always. Yeah, I, I, I to say, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of, um, you know, podcast at the moment getting information out there it's all about learning the great thing is Bryce and myself are learning every day everybody's learning this space if anyone turns around and says they know it all they, they don't know it we're, we're, we're so early we're still learning every day so every day is a different day um something new will come out that we didn't um know was going to happen or we didn't expect and so you know um the resilience the great thing is the resilience of bitcoin so i don't really you know if i go back to 2021 i maybe looked at the price of bitcoin a bit more often than i should have done but you know um i don't tend to look at it now i i've sort of really taken that pill and sort of you know can see you know the the, the longer the longer picture in this in this space at the moment um i i you know i'd like to hope that the mining companies you know um, will at some point turn and, and you know if the Bitcoin price um, starts to rally post the halving as it has done in previous cycles and significantly in previous cycles um, that means that you know the mining companies will be obviously um, you know booking more revenue in a month booking more margins and so therefore you know um, stock price might become more appealing then um, to go there but uh, yeah as I say there are so many different investments that people can choose now to align uh, with crypto before the mining stocks were really the only proxy out there and that you could you could have in sort of like your investment accounts um, like the Roth, Roth IRA account or an ISA account in the UK where you've got some sort of like tax-free shelter now there are many more opportunities to do that so maybe that initial you know movement there but um, you know we've seen before um, you know price action changes significantly and as the bitcoin price can change four or five percent in a day these mining companies can change 30 40 50 percent in a day so um you know that's that can happen again in the future it's happened significantly in re with regularity in the past so you know we, we we wait and see well and as you said with that story about mara and argo right uh these companies can seven eight nine ten thirty x 
in a period of months. So again, you guys, uh, definitely volatile. That's part of what you signed up for. I just checked the Bitcoin price. Uh, Bitcoin is still down, but about half of the miners are actually in the green today, Anthony, which tells you, you guys, that the overselling is, is slowing down and um, there, there may be a bottom to this yet, but thanks for watching you guys appreciate it as always. Like we say, you're helping us, uh, support our dream here in the Bitcoin space. We appreciate each and every one of you. We'd appreciate you even more if you were going to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. And of course, leave us a comment in the section below. Let us know how you got involved in the Bitcoin mining space, when your orange pill moment was, and what you think is going to happen to these miners for the remainder of 2024. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you tomorrow.